Good morning. My name is Maria de Rosario Palacios, and I am a board member here at the Georgia Budget Policy Institute. I want to welcome you to GBPI's 16th Annual Policy Conference, Insights 2022, Treating Care Workers as Essential, Not Invisible. This is a two-day conference. Today, you will get context and hear big ideas to map out where care workers and the caring system have been, where they are, and where they might be looking to go. At 7 p.m. tonight, we'll have a grassroots training for you where you can learn how to connect those big ideas to practical steps to build a more equitable future. Tomorrow, starting at 9 a.m., we'll dig deep into how state and federal dollars drive the change and how these big ideas get legs and walk all across Georgia straight to the halls of power. Through it all, we want you to remember four simple truths. One, Black women care workers are the backbone of Georgia's workforce, making all other work possible. Two, racism, disinvestment, and a brutal pandemic have hit Black women care workers especially hard. Three, an economy in which Black women care workers thrive is an economy where we all thrive. We, the people of Georgia, can make change happen. There are a lot of people and organizations who have made today possible. GBPI would like to thank the sponsors of Insights 2022, whose support is helping to drive conversations around equity in Georgia's policy landscape. Support from these sponsors ensured each one of us were able to join today safely, virtually, and free of charge. So I'd like to give a special thank you to the following sponsors. Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, Georgia Familias Unidas, Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities, the Metro Atlanta Chamber, Southern Poverty Law Center, United Way of Greater Atlanta, Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education, GEARS, Georgia for a Healthy Future, ESSIG Public Policy Research, and Voices for Georgia's Children. Now, before we get started, I do want to let you know a little bit of how this conference will work. I know every virtual conference is different. Even those of you who have attended last year might find some new and improved features. First, you likely saw that when you joined the session, a new tab popped out. This is where you see a video, but on the far right, you're gonna see messaging and questions. You can drop questions for our panelists in the questions section and any other comments in the chat. After each panel, you'll head back to the original browser window to navigate to the next schedule. Our networking sessions are gonna work like Zoom meetings. So when you click to join, your Zoom application is gonna open up. If you look at the original browser window with the full conference website, you'll see a menu on the left with several items. One, you'll see the schedule. If you're watching this, you probably figured out how to access a session. So you can click schedule. The full set schedule has every single event. In each schedule item, you can also click join online session to see the panel. Under people, you can see a list of attendees. We hope that you'll find people you wanna engage with. Where there are speakers asking questions or dropping comments in the chat. When you see someone you wanna speak more with, head to the people section, search the name and then click connect. Once connected, you can message them in the event page or even send them an email. In the bulletin, you'll find tweets using the hashtag insights22, as well as other posts people can add. If you wanna post a message to the bulletin, just click create a post. Each schedule item has a list of speakers, but you can also see the full list under the speakers menu item. Please check out our sponsors in the sponsors menu item. You can find all the sponsors there, including the ones I just mentioned by name. All materials related to our panels can also be found both in the schedule item and the materials menu item. And finally, there's a link to donate. Don't forget to donate. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll be able to contact support if you have any questions and check your notifications. Now, GBPI can also help you in the chat, so feel free to drop questions there. And with much further ado, I wanna transition us to our panel. Thank you so much, Maria Del Rosario. Hello, and welcome to our first opening uh, fireside chat, a conversation about Georgia's care ecosystem. My name is Ife Finch Floyd, and I'm the senior policy analyst for economic justice at GBPI. Unfortunately, Jacqueline Israel of the Georgia chapter of the Nationals a Domestic Workers Alliance cannot be with us today, so we are going to have a shift in our uh, panelists, but I think we're still going to have an amazing conversation. 
all workers have struggled and women of color particularly have struggled um, during the pandemic. And this is in spite of the fact that they bear a lot of the weight in keeping the economy going. In fact, they are often forced to do more with less. In Georgia, we know black and other women of color are disproportionately represented as care workers. And that includes uh, care workers um, who are health care direct service providers or child care workers. PHI National estimates that in Georgia, 66% of direct service care workforce, these are occupations like home health aides, are Black, and 93% are women. GBPI estimates that in Georgia, more than half of child care workers are women of color, and, uh, and more than one third of child care workers are Black women. Unfortunately, many care workers are living just above and sometimes even below the poverty line, despite having earnings. During this conference, we are paying specific attention to care workers who make all work possible. But these are women who have historically been um, invisible and undervalued and who during the pandemic have put their bodies on the line to care for our loved ones. Throughout the conference, we will consider the policies that support and bolster care workers who are often black and other women of color. These policies can not only support them, but also all workers and all families. For this conversation, we have two outstanding leaders fighting for worker power. I am joined by the executive director of Pro Georgia, Tamika, Tamika Atkins, as well as Maria Del Rosario Palacios, who you just met. At Pro Georgia, Tamika leads the group's work coordinating, the, excuse me, coordinating the civic engagement efforts of member organizations in areas like voter engagement and issue organizing. Maria Del Rosario is not only a board member of GBPI, she is also acting executive director for Georgia Fam um, Familias Unidas, an organization helping Georgia workers organize for the betterment of the Latinx community. This is going to be a very short session. It concludes at 1.45. So we're not going to be taking questions. We really wanna maximize this conversation. But remember, um, if you are tweeting throughout the conference to use the hashtag insights22, that's hashtag insights22. All right, let's get started. Maria Del Rosario, let's start with you. Can you please just offer a little bit of background about what life was like for workers um, who were looking for, for care for either an elderly caregiver or, uh, excuse me, an elderly family member or a disabled family member or their children before the pandemic? Well, this is work that, you know, always goes underpaid and, and it's more than double time. Um, especially I, I know with, with different generations, I mean, you know, millennials, Generation X are having to care for both, right? Generations before them and the generations um, that came after them. And so there was, there was already very, very low pay available. You know, folks live paycheck to paycheck, if that. Um, so if you can imagine that the setup, especially around places where there's a lot of like factory work where people are working 60, 70 hours and care workers sometimes don't know what time uh, someone's going to come home to pick up their children because they're asked that very same day to stay 10, 12 hours. They're pressured into it. Um, and there's very little time to give notice. You know, we see this a lot in the Hall County community. We see this a lot in, in North Georgia. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's not like care workers are, are making more. There's folks who make $20 a day taking care of two children. Um, and, you know, you can't live off $20. So what are they doing? You know, they're having to take in 10, 12 children at a time. Um, it's, it's, it's not the best, you know, way to be able to even live. Um, and so, you know, we were already behind. As, as a community um, and the pandemic made it that much worse. 
especially when we know that in, in March 2020, when many of us got the opportunity to start working from home, um, essential workers did not. And so because essential workers did not, care workers definitely didn't. Um, and now kids were not be able to go to school. So the, the hours were tripled for care workers and it was an immense problem. Thank you for that. So groups like the National Domestic Workers Alliance and others have put a focus on narrative change and increasing the visibility of care and other domestic workers. What specific narratives need to be shifted and, and why is this uh, really important for structural change? And this question is open to both of you. I don't know who wants to start. Um, I'll start. Thank you, Ife. Um, you know, when we talk about structural change and narrative change, workers' rights are a women's rights issue. And, you know, when we ignore the unique challenge that women face as both workers and primary caregivers, then we're actually ignoring the kind of structural changes that are going to benefit care workers, domestic workers, and workers in general. You know, women are often serving a dual role. Uh, we are workers and primary household caregivers. Over 15 million families in the US with children have a breadwinner mother that contributes at least 40% of their household's earnings. Women spend nearly 40% more time managing their households compared to their male counterparts. Uh, in Georgia specifically, 93% of the direct service care workers here are women, right? Uh, if we want to support care workers in our state, we have to support women in the workforce as a whole. Nearly 80% of Black women in America are breadwinners. Most Black women are likely to be raising families on their own. I'm an example of that. In Georgia, 66% of our direct care service workers are Black women. Typically for Black women and women of color, you know, once the workday is done, they have to manage their own household. And again, I think to Maria's point about that, that the time theft that happens is that women of color are often put in a very precarious position. Go home to care for your home and your children or risk losing your job, you know. Um, you know, women who come from historically disenfranchised communities were often depicted as, you know, being powerless. And, you know, that's part of the narrative that has to shift. Uh, first of all, we are not powerless. And, you know, that goes back to the root of organizing. While we might on our own feel a lack of power, if we are organized as women, organized as women of color, Black women in particular, across jobs and sectors, there's strength and then there's powers in numbers. Um, and I just, you know, want to, you know, iterate something that I learned a couple of years ago that, that surprised me. Again, back to this workers' rights and women's rights. Nearly two-thirds of minimum wage earners are women, but we do not talk about minimum wage uh, often enough as a women's rights issue. You know, when you think about the fact that a quarter of all minimum wage earners, 25% are women of color. We're talking about a base of workers that are women that once collectively organized can be and will be very powerful and can activate policy change. So reframing the narrative to center on empowerment is a critical step towards workers wielding their own power. And again, that's the, that's the history behind the Fight for 15 campaign. That's the history behind and the strength behind the National Domestic Workers Alliance. They focus very heavily on narrative change. And when we organize and activate women to get out, to register to vote, cast their ballots, right? We're increasing the likelihood that we can see policies passed that are going to tangibly impact their lives and their livelihoods. Thank you so much for that. So I, I, I heard a lot around narrative change around women's empowerment, shifting this narrative around the minimum wage is a women's issue, right? Um, excellent. Maria Del Rosario? You know, to make me so many excellent points. And, you know, I, I, I think of my own narrative, you know, and I, I don't want to only share my narrative, but I think it's important to mention, you know, especially I'm here, I'm three weeks out from birth giving, uh, three weeks or less, because I can't predict the future. 
Um, and I think of every single thing that structurally we are having to go up against. And there's moments, you know, this is, I'll, I'll share a little bit about myself. This, you know, this pregnancy is the first pregnancy I've ever experienced gestational diabetes. And with that has come many complications. Um, with that, there's suspicions of other problems that I have that I can't be evaluated for because they're invasive uh, procedures or evaluations that could put at risk the life of my child. And so, you know, we know Georgia's uh, horrible mortality rates, and we don't talk about these experiences that lead up to those mortality rates where we could have right, had the things prevented. And then you think of, you know, having to choose to take time off work to attend all the appointments that you need. Um, and, you know, short-term disability uh, form, short-term disability qualifications for folks who are lucky enough to have them are so particular about whether you qualify for them or not. Oftentimes women have to choose between keeping even their job that was gonna provide some kind of income uh, during, during a parental leave and being able to go to every single prenatal or specialist appointment, especially if they take up the majority of the week. And so these narratives are not told. Why? Because women of color, Black women especially, have always had to be silent about the pain, the suffering, and the complications that every single day they overcome just to show up to work, let alone be able to carry it out. And so these are the things that we're, we're not talking enough about. You know, we're not talking about how care workers are overextended, overworked, and their needs are, are, are placed like as if, you know, almost as if you're not human, almost as if you're supposed to be a machine that runs off very little fuel and um, a pandemic, you know, that is putting your children at risk of COVID when you're having to go out to work, putting yourself at risk you know, there's not policy changes for this. We haven't changed short-term disability uh, clauses to allow for folks who are sick beyond the two week period and don't recover for them, right? Because it doesn't interfere with their quote unquote day-to-day -day abilities, but it could make their coworkers sick. There's no collective consideration for that. And, and that's the problem because we don't think enough about how care workers are the foundation of the collective systems we exist in. We don't think about how care workers even provide the ability for many folks who are, are leading our country, are leading big businesses to be able to have advanced in the careers that they have advanced. Um, and I won't even start, um, there's, there's a lot in our community, a lot of narratives that are untold in silence because there's also undocumented immigrants or immigrants that are facing just other issues where someone is, is, is exploiting their immigration status and not paying them. And so, you know, wage theft is, is rampant. And so these are the things that I think we need to start talking more about. Otherwise, the, the policy structure is not going to change. Right. Thank you so much for that. So, you know, really lifting up individual stories as a part of a collective, right? And, and um, making the experiences, not only of workers, but, fam uh, but of families, um, which you can't really separate. And that's kind of what you're talking about, Maria de Rosario. You cannot separate these two, but really lifting up um, these stories to bring a more holistic picture to care workers' lives and care and, and the needs of care workers. Um, another point I wanted to bring up um, around narratives is how a lot of these narratives are um, were had their basis in enslavement, the enslavement of, of Black people um, and specifically Black women. And in fact, this idea of the mammy, right? Black women were expected to uh, take care of white children in addition to their own and to their other responsibilities. They were often the ones who had to take care of um, other, um, you know, enslaved family members and people um, because, you know, they didn't, they couldn't have access to the doctor, right? Um, so this idea of the Black woman of, as a caregiver has a lot of foundation um, in and, and the expectation um, that they have to do this work has its basis in enslavement and continues today. And what we've seen historically is that Black women um, ex continue to experience um, occupational segregation into these domestic work um, 
uh, fields and sectors. Um, and these, uh, these narratives um, around Black women and, and only being seen as um, caregivers, or that's one idea, right, um, that's pervasive, um, justifies some of that. And then there's this larger narrative that women generally have to are, you know, are are the sole uh, person who is responsible for caring for children. And as both of you talked about so eloquently, not only caring for children, but also having to take care of the rest of the home and or work. Um, so again, you know, this, these narratives and these ideas have been foundational to our country um, and really continue today and kind of shifting and redefining that care work is real work. It is skilled work. Um, and we need to begin to think about these occupations differently. Um, thank you so much. Sorry, got on my... <laughs> <laughs> so box a little well, bit. Tamika, did you have other thoughts there? Ife, you inspired me. Um, so thank you. You know, um, the National Labor Relations Act in the U.S. was what like was the basis for labor protections for workers in this country. And there were two categories of workers that were intentionally excluded, domestic workers and migrant workers. Uh, these are the workers that were formerly enslaved Africans. This was a concession, a political concession to Southern lawmakers to maintain a form of control, right, over African-Americans, it was quite clear. Um, and so when you talk about the connection and the history there, it is not, it, it's not an accident. So now this racialized exclusion from labor protections has now expanded to impact more than just African-Americans and the black community. It actually now impacts women of color and people of color in particular, um, our Latinx brothers and sisters who are also in these fields with us and now do not have uh, the kind of protections that they should have in the workplace. And, and you know, it, I mean, wage theft is common, time theft, and the theft of time is not a small thing. Um, it adds up, it's pretty common. A uh, lack of benefits, um, lack of protections if uh, an employer has uh, expressed uh, discriminatory or inappropriate behavior. There is no um, method for filing and making formalized complaints. So this lack of protection, it, it's, a, it's pretty deep and it is connected, very clearly connected to race. And I just wanted to chime in um, around unemployment compensation. You know, during the 1935 Social Security Act, where we found, you know, started our uh, unemployment compensation um, program, who was excluded? Right, agricultural workers and domestic workers. Again, <laughs> right, Tamika. Um, and that was about 90% of all black women who were who were working in the workforce, right? So um, again, this, 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 these are historical um, policies that continue um, to have impacts today, right? We, we have seen unemployment compensation change and 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 uh, over time, um, but you know, we, we know that um, Black and other women of color are working low-wage jobs and maybe not full-time, so they're still uh, potentially ineligible for unemployment compensation. Um, great. Thank you so much for those comments. Tamika, I want to go to you again. Can you please describe the work um, that Pro-Georgia is doing to engage care workers and other workers for structural change? Um, so if I, I would start with um, with what I would call at home, the work we started with at Pro Georgia, um, you know, um, with the pandemic, with COVID-19, I mean, we, like all other organizations, pivoted. Um, I think in some ways, many of us who come with uh, an organizing perspective to this work, um, who see civic engagement as a part of movement building and power building, um, many of us, I think, saw an opportunity here, a door cracked. A little bit, what can we slide through, right? What can we push through now? What can we do differently? Uh, and one thing that we did at Pro Georgia is that we provided childcare reimbursements to all eligible staff uh, because just the unrealistic expectation for our, our workers, our employees to continue working full time while being at home with caregiving responsibilities. 
Um, and, you know, we're, we're pretty proud of that program. Uh, we then, you know, nothing happens in isolation, especially when you're in a coalition. And so I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of other leaders, particularly women of color. A majority of the table, 70% of the directors at Paul Georgia State Table are women of color. And so talking to them about their needs, about this idea of a child care reimbursement, uh, and one is folks loved it. Uh, two of our other organizations adopted the model and we were able to share with them the paperwork, like the guidelines, how to make this happen so that they could then offer a similar reimbursement program within their organization. And then Pro Georgia went a step, uh, step further. Uh, I was able to raise money from some really great uh, funders to support a child care grant program. And so we re-granted to our partners to about eight organizations that applied nearly $283,000 to help uh, cover some of their child care expenses that their employees were facing uh, for, uh, for all of 2020, right? So we're starting with how do we build these different practices? Um, when we think about structurally, like long-term structure change, right, we're modeling something, we need to have uh, child care support on election day. The same way we have rides to the polls, we need to have child care to the polls. And this is an idea and a project um, with research behind it. We partnered with the Analyst Institute in uh, 2018 to 2019 to determine if there is interest, what would the impact be? Could there potentially see, we can potentially see an increase in the turnout of women of color voters if there was some child care support on election day? Um, you know, women of color workers, domestic workers often work, you know, uh, irregular hours, right? Sometimes inconsistent days. And so it can be really difficult to schedule and plan things like voting right, when you have, you know, a, a kind of a schedule that doesn't allow you to remove yourself from the workplace to go vote, right? Um, so imagine going to vote after work and the added barrier of bringing your children with you. Um, I, you know, Georgia, we have been on the news telling you what you already know for several <laughs> years um, about, you know, the structural uh, voter suppression that happens here. Right. So what we're doing now is we're just adding on uh, layers and layers of barriers. You know, what would it look like to provide child care support on Election Day where we can support women workers in making their voices heard? Um, we should take it further and designate Election Day as a paid holiday. Right. So we're talking about a yes and not an either or so that we can ensure that all workers are given the opportunity to make their voices heard without fear of missing work or missing pay. Um, you know, taking measures that reduce barriers to voting, like the long wait times, um, you know, uh, <laughs> lack of, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about all the stuff that you all know, actual access to drop boxes, consistent, uh, consistently administering our election across all 159 counties. We have to look at reducing those barriers to voting as also enfranchising women and enfranchising women workers, right? Again, back to that narrative change and the structural change and then how they all come together. Um, you know, we're all waiting to see about this recent announcement um, from my Secretary of State about the new voter registration system that's intended to streamline the process. Um, I think we're all holding our breath uh, to see what the outcome really is. Um, but for sure, Ife, in order to achieve the structural changes that we need to reform our country, those that are most impacted, they have to be able to participate. Uh, and women workers' voices must be seen as mandatory and required to be included in any structural change that we're trying to accomplish. And in doing so, we're gonna ignite the kind of change that will create better policies for, all, for us all in the future. Thank you so much. I, I love that childcare um, along with rides to the polls. Um, excellent. Uh, Maria Del Rosario, can you please talk about some of your organizing work in the Latinx community as well? Yes, I'd love to. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty honored to not only be here as someone who's had the opportunity to exist in policy spaces and, and help push them along. Um, my first career was in manufacturing in the food industry. 
Um, I worked in poultry. I am one of the many poultry plant workers in Gainesville that help supply the food chain across, across the country and across the world. And I'm very proud of that. Um, I've also had the experience of doing it as an undocumented worker. So I uniquely know a lot of the, um, the minute issues that, that go unsaid. And so, you know, last year around this time, there was a nitrogen tragedy leak that, that could have been prevented that took the lives of six folks and it impacted over 200 workers of which the majority were women, single women with children. And so, and, and that's what you see in a lot of these uh, factories. The ma majority of the production workers are single mothers who um, have different challenges when it comes to immigration statuses. And they're paid, they were being paid seven to $9 an hour, even though they'd been there for, for years. And so, we started organizing right away. And you know, I am very proud of the, um, because this is a volunteer run group, uh, Georgia Femina Sunias. I'm very proud of the, the many volunteers who stepped up because what we prioritized first was not, um, it wasn't a rally. It wasn't a, it wasn't a call to our legislators, although all of those things happened down the line. What we did first is we sat down with our community and we said, we know you're hurting, tell us what you need. Tell us exactly what you need, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you're worried about, and we're gonna try to provide some relief. And so there was amazing nonprofit organizations who helped donate to help provide um, a small stipend for medical needs, a small stipend for prescriptions, a small stipend, uh, some of them were gonna fall behind on rent because they lost two weeks, up to three weeks of work. Some of them were laid off work. Um, and we address their, their own human needs first, which is what we should always be doing when we, uh, when we take on policy issues because we can start there first and it doesn't jeopardize the rest. And then we had beautiful, courageous women, matriarchs of their family, matriarchs of generations who, who stood up against their employer. We had over 21 folks for the first time ever in, that I had ever seen in, in this industry um, actually report the issues to a government agency, OSHA, um, and it took building trust and it took us helping build that trust um, and also ensuring that there was going to be some kind of protections for the folks that stepped forward. And so it's been a um, it's been a beautiful movement. It's taken a lot of nonprofit organizations that are part of, uh, I know, the Pro Georgia Table and other amazing uh, coalitions in the state. And, you know, nationally now there's a huge push for um, protections against immigration issues being weaponized against folks who have suffered, lost their lives. Imagine if the first time that we're granting permanent residency to our undocumented food workers is when they pass away, then we have felt beyond belief as a country. And so I'm very proud that from a very tragic moment, there's courageous people um, in our community people that, that are Spanish uh, monolingual speakers who have been here for decades, who were due an opportunity to be able to provide for their children without having to hide in the shadows a long time ago. And we're hoping that um, the promises of this administration, because there's now a national push with, um, with the Department of Labor and the Department of Homeland Security to provide relief. And we've gotten memos. Um, the NLRB has come out with memos on uh, protections that they're going to execute. And so you better believe that as a small volunteer run um, organization, we have been holding that fire to um, agencies that I don't think um, we, we ever dreamed of um, emailing or, or calling out in this way. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful that that will change things forward. Thank you so much for sharing that work. Incredible. And congratulations for all the um, progress uh, you've made with that, um, with your organizing efforts. Thank you. Um, so I want to, we have heard a lot about the concrete experiences of not just care workers, but certainly uh, workers who receive low wages generally. Um, but let's, I want to also think optimistically, right? What hope do both of you have for structural change that will better support individual workers generally or care workers specifically um, and how that will better support Georgia families? Oh, uh, hope, right? Um, as we enter um, 
what uh, a friend of mine affectionately calls uh, 2020 part three. Um, <clears throat> and we have, to, we have to dig really deep for hope right now. And I'm just being really honest about where I'm at um, because I'm sure viewers, uh, this is gonna resonate with them, my honesty. But digging deep to find that hope. Uh, we, as a society, we've been having more serious discussions about what unskilled labor really means. Um, I think if you look at discussions around unskilled labor a decade ago versus now, it is no longer taken as an automatic, uh, yes, un that this labor is unskilled and unworthy of pay and respect, right? I think that is an idea that is slowly falling out of fashion um, as more and more people are starting to engage with that question around what does unskilled labor really mean? Uh, what do basic human rights really mean, right? We're grappling with, I think, uh, more like larger issues and, and things that we took for granted when we think about language, position, pay, uh, stability, a lot has changed uh, because of COVID. Um, the pandemic has just brought all these topics to the forefront of conversations about labor in this country. Um, and it's just, just not a topic that employers and legislators can write off anymore. Um, I think a lot of people are seeing that unskilled labor, right, quotation marks, goes into uh, everyday functions of their lives, right? Um, and how complex these roles are and how dependent we as individuals, families, and society are on these unskilled labor uh, positions. Um, I also think, which I, I said before, I think the pandemic is really illustrating something that I think many of us already knew internally is that workers' rights is a women's rights issue, right? And how we have to start seeing the two as, as not as separated um, as I think we've historically dealt with these two social justice issues. Um, you know, I think when we invest in large structural supports like social services and social safety nets, you know, when we pay our workers more across the board, when we close the gender pay gap, uh, when we ensure that families have affordable and quality childcare, you know, these are the type of, you know, nationwide initiatives that help support each and every individual worker. You know, Georgia, you know, our lack of uh, child care infrastructure is economically a losing game. Um, every year, the lack of a child care infrastructure in Georgia leads to like at least 1.75 billion in economic activity losses and an additional 105 million in annual tax revenue losses. So in other words, you want everybody to get out to work, <laughs> but there's no child care infrastructure to support everybody getting out to work. Again, I believe I'm preaching to the choir, but um, you know, women are juggling long work days. Um, we're managing the bulk, if not all, of our household work. Um, and we're also providing childcare. And this is just not sustainable for workers, um, for Georgia, and definitely not for our country. So, you know, investing in structural supports that ease the burden for women who um, often play dual roles managing the home and childcare will, in turn, directly support our economy. Maria de Rosario. I, I agree that it's, it's a little difficult to write to look for hope in these times. Um, you know, I, I dig deep every day. Um, and I, I have, you know, yeah. And so, um, but you know, I will say that I think that there's, there's some movement that I'm seeing. Um, if you haven't figured it out right now, I'm, I'm a big grass tops kind of person. Um, there's movements of workers that, that I have found uh, to be inspirational. And there's also a shift in, in discussions about workplace issues that people are starting to speak up about. And I, I like to see that. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Um, I'm a big fan of seeing the great resignation. Um, every single time um, I see a good tweet or a good meme about it, I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic. Um, I've, been, I've been following some of the articles that they've been writing about you know, workers being fed up. And that's been the case in industries like the poultry industry in Hall County. There is, you know, but, you know, and, and unfortunately, it was, it wasn't as much of an intentional thing as it was 
folks were getting sick and they couldn't return to work after two weeks. And they saw their coworkers returning at two weeks or earlier and pass away. And so what started happening in a lot of these factories, they started raising the wages significantly. I mean, there's places that used to pay a uh, minimum of seven an hour. They're now paying 12, 14 an hour. And while, you know, these things are, um, have to become much more sustainable and they have to change and there has to be policy protections because otherwise they're, they become small wins or, or unfortunately someone comes in and, and has a policy to the opposite effect to prevent it from happening again. And so we need long-term policy changes, but I, I have found um, some hope in the fact that there's also been workers who chose to leave horrible working conditions, horrible pay and say, no, you know, you can, you can have your job. I'm gonna look for a better one because I deserve a better one. And I think that's where it, it, needs, it needs to continue to happen. These dialogues need to happen. We don't need to be afraid to talk about them. I know there's some taboo uh, topics sometimes that in the past we've kept to ourselves, but I think the culture shifting is indicative of, of a future change in the structures. Thank you so much for um, sharing those thoughts and particularly sharing your ideas of hope. I know, <laughs> uh, Timmy, I think that was that was a great uh, point. Twenty twenty part th uh, three, um, but I I appreciate it and um, uh, definitely am truly grateful to the both of you for joining us today and talking about. Um, the real world, real life experience of workers, care workers, um, poultry workers um, as well. Thank you. So, so um, happy to have you. Um, so this concludes our um, opening conversation of Insights 2020. So um, next we will have uh, two panel sessions that you can join in cadence. Um, and they are going to start at 2 p.m. So we're going to have about a 15 minute break um, and then join our two uh, panel conversations um, around, um, again, specifically around child care workers and child care work and also um, direct service um, care workers and um, the healthcare industry as well. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our panelists again. <laughs>